Dear viewers, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Danilo Lukiewski and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of the KU Security Forum. I would like to introduce our distinguished guest. Uh, first of all, let me welcome the Foreign Minister of Lithuania, Mr. Linus Linkavichus, who joined our discussion. I thank you, sir, for doing this. Uh, I'm happy to welcome here the former Prime Minister and former Foreign Minister of Sweden, Sweden uh, Mr. Karl Bildt. I, I do thank you for for accepting our invitation. We have a special guest from Poland, uh, Senator Martin Bosacki, uh, who is the Deputy Chief of the Foreign Policy Committee uh, of the Polish Parliament and uh, former Ambassador of Poland to, to Canada. I thank you, sir, for finding a possibility to be with us today. I'm happy to introduce thank you. Ms. Ms. Ivana uh, Klimpurstensadze, the chairwoman of the European Integration Committee of Ukraine's Parliament, of Ukraine's RADA. I thank you, Ivana, for, for being with us and look forward to your contribution. And you. uh, if, uh, uh, that's a distinctly pleasure for me to, to greet Ambassador Kurt Walker, a uh, former special representative for Ukraine negotiations, uh, for being with us. And uh, finally, let me, let me greet uh, Mr. Uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, former Prime Minister of Ukraine and the Chairman of the Kyiv Security Forum. I thank you, Arseniy, for joining us. So, uh, for Ukraine, I will start from, from, from the most important thing that I'm going to, to say today. For Ukraine, the most important goal, as we understand it, is to ensure its reliable defense against um, the existential threat which comes from Russia and, uh, as we understand, which is not going to disappear even when Putin dies. Uh, how to protect ourselves? How to, live, how to live with the war at the gates? And despite that, how to build a prosperous and comfortable state? That's, these are Ukraine's, Ukraine's questions. Along with the efficient containment of Russia, Ukraine's success envisages a few other strategic preconditions. Among them, strong transatlantic, trans transatlantic link with the United States, real integration into the European Union, and beneficial practical solidarity with its neighbors. That's what our security requires. Today's debate starts a series of discussions on Ukraine's foreign policy. How to boost Ukraine's real Western integration and how to strengthen Eastern Europe as we find this region of vital importance for, for our nation uh, and for Europe in general. Uh, so these questions become more and more important as these days uh, President Zelensky marks his first uh, year in the office with all his few accomplishments and many um, failures and difficulties. So let me start by asking uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, even critics recognize that one of the most important accomplishments of your two governments in 2014 and 16 uh, has been Ukraine's energy independence. That achievement won't be possible without uh, um, our direct neighbors and uh, closest regional allies. It's a practical example of that mutual cooperation. Don't you find that nowadays we lack this kind of uh, cooperation in our region? Uh, don't you think that we should ignite the strategic partnership in Eastern Europe with new energy? And who can do it? The floor is yours, sir. Let me start with the cooperation between Ukraine and the European Union. We achieved a lot together. We managed to provide an energy independence to Ukraine. Look, even the miracle happened when the Ukrainian people got the visa-free regime. Together with the European partners and the United States, we deterred the Russian aggression and imposed sanctions against the Russian Federation. Together, we started an unprecedented reforms in Ukraine. So the best answer to isolationism is integration. The best answer to dictatorship is democracy and more democracy. The best answer to crisis is cooperation. The best answer to corruption is independent courts and rule of law. Uh, look at the numbers. 
The majority of Ukrainians, they still overwhelmingly support both the EU integration and integration into the NATO. And right now, it's up close to the European Union to lead by an example, an example of the prosperous and strong society. And it's, it's practically a responsibility of the Ukrainian government to move reforms further and to be on this way towards the European Union as strong as possible. Uh, in terms of the regional cooperation, this is another very important issue, extremely important. Let me start with the message that I believe that Ukraine is to become the part of a number of regional initiatives. Three things. Tell me the reason why Ukraine is not the part of this uh, initiative. B9, which, which, which is more correlated with the NATO issues. Ukraine has to be a partner in this type of regional initiatives. So we need to have more decisive, more robust and stronger international cooperation with our regional friends, like Lithuania, like Poland, like Hungary. And we need to turn the page, to turn the page of past discrepancies and past dramas, to reconcile and to look into the future. This is the aim, to have a joint, prosperous and bright future for Ukraine, for the European Union, and for our friends in the U United States. Wonderful. All right. I thank you. And now for, uh, let me turn to, to the Foreign Minister of Lithuania. Mr. Minister, I, let me start by saying that Ukraine highly appreciates, and many people in Ukraine highly appreciate, what Lithuania has been doing for the freedom, security, and uh, the European integration of Ukraine. Uh, mm, uh, it, it goes without saying that Lithuania is, is, the, is the champion of the international support uh, of uh, our, our nation. And we always rely upon your honest advice and true support. Mr. Minister, my question to, to you would be twofold. How should we avoid the EU, non-EU dividing lines in our region? And what would you honestly recommend Ukraine's leadership as these days what we feel Ukraine's into European integration literally experiences lack of political will and stamina. The floor is yours. Thank you and also thank you for opportunity to meet all good friends although not personally but it's uh, nevertheless it's important. Same, same importance uh, lays uh, with the, our common task to keep Ukrainian issue on board in the radar screen, despite of pandemics, despite of other challenges, what we are all facing, in particular in the European Union, be it uh, discussions on MFF or, or, or let's say, endless story on Brexit, uh, which is also quite painful. So really, m many challenges and problems, and we need to keep it on our agenda and not to forget, at least, uh, what is not easily uh, going, uh, I have to say, uh, quite frankly, to the friends. So a common task to make it, uh, make it uh, as, as it was very, very important. Also, using this opportunity, let me also say uh, that to today is a very important day of remembrance uh, of forceful deportation of Crimean Tatars. And we should uh, statement on behalf of three, three Baltic uh, countries and also also uh, stressed once again how it is important not only to state that we do not recognize uh, annexation of Crimea, but also uh, we should fill this with the substance. There should be very clear and visible and tangible consequences, uh, political, financial, diplomatic, whatsoever. Uh, that's, uh, that's important to remind. And uh, let, me, let me say today, especially uh, where the, we have this anniversary. Uh, also, we have to state that uh, situation, in spite of virus, uh, hasn't changed with regard to propaganda or even direct aggression. And this is not just our feeling, but there are uh, also statistics indicating, in indicating the situation, comparing the same period of last year, more shellings, more violations, even I would say expanding from Russian side, and also uh, uh, testing, uh, testing policy uh, taking place as it was before, trying to project uh, Russia as mediator, as observer, and this idea of, uh, we already stated that publicly, idea of this advisory board, uh, which was uh, not created, but was discussed, I understand, but this is also kind of 
uh, smells uh, that Russia would like to pr pr portray herself as a as observer from the side and trying to say that conflict taking place in Ukraine among Ukrainians, but we are uh, repeating all the time that this is Russian aggression against Ukraine and this is completely different. What we can do uh, uh, definitely to continue on the path of reforms, which is uh, uh, easy, easy to say, not so easy to implement. But last uh, decisions of the parliament, we commended that publicly as well, the uh, law on land reform. Also, it was very difficult to pass, I understand, law, law on banking sector, but it was done. So it's exactly this, the main and most, most important argument to those skeptics who uh, do not believe that the situation is improving or at least going, going so to say, ahead with, with regard to the reforms. What we have to do in the future, I believe, again, to focus on the on the areas of strengthening of rule of law, uh, reform uh, prosecution, prosecutor office, as we are always repeating, uh, judiciary, uh, continue fighting corruption, uh, also also ensure independence of, of these institutions. And it's important uh, also for investment climate. So all in all, regardless aggression, regardless pandemics, uh, nobody will lower the requirements. So. We will be uh, not just standing by, but as I said, we'll be as active as it is, as it is possible to help. Uh, but definitely, we cannot do for Ukraine. We, we, can, we really can, can, can just assist, and that's also important key message from, from my side. So uh, uh, I hope we will continue in the same spirit. I re regret very, very much that we have to cancel Ukraine Refor Reform Conference. It was planned in July 7th, but due to the situation, will be... It's not cancelled, but postponed, very important to say. So we will take the uh, opportunity to organize as soon as it is, as it is possible. And we'll continue uh, this focused uh, dialogue and, and uh, discussion on these issues. Uh, what we have to really <laughs> understand that uh, uh, the support uh, from uh, our colleagues in European Union are not terribly big, as I said, not very enthusiastic so far. So our task is to make it really very serious and at least I can tell you from Lithuanian point of view that sovereign Ukraine, European Ukraine with European choice, it's also part of our national security interests of Lithuania. I hope it's also, it could be shared with others and let's, let's, let's go on, so to say, because it's our common task and, and common, common vision. Um, I do thank you, Mr. Minister, for, for finding a possibility to join us and for your important message that I believe would be heard here in, in, uh, in Kiev and in Ukraine. And now I turn to Prime Minister Karl Bildt, a true friend of Ukraine uh, and a great, I would say, connoisseur on, on Ukraine affairs. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for, being, for, for joining us. Uh, I would like to refer to, to your article, which is called Welcome to the Post-American World, published at the end of April 2020. In that article, you conclude that the spirit of uh, global cooperation is under attack. And with President Trump, the United States leadership is over. And then you ask, could the European Union step up? Could some entirely new coalition be forced to get the ball rolling? Mr. Prime Minister, have you already found found the, the answer to that difficult question. Uh, given your knowledge and experience, what would you recommend to strengthen, what would you recommend to do to strengthen Eastern Europe, including Ukraine? And in your opinion, how should the leadership in this part of Europe look like? The floor is yours. It's been nicer to meet all of you in person, but I hope those uh... The, those days are not that distant when we'll be able to sit down around the table and uh, share views uh, and perhaps even a glass of beer at some point in time. Uh, we are living in very difficult times, there's no question about that. Already before the COVID crisis, the global system of cooperation was uh, under threat, under strain due to a number of different circumstances. We have a revisionist Russia. I don't need to spell that out more than you are aware of in Ukraine. We have an assertive China in X numbers of areas. And we have a fairly disruptive United States. And of course, when we have now entered the COVID crisis, which is a global mega crisis of a dimension we haven't seen in modern times, 
which will define the world in the years ahead. Then, of course, we've seen global cooperation faltering even more when if we, it would have been normal times. We would rather have said, this is a global crisis, let's formulate a global answer. Instead, we rather see global tensions building up in different ways. Now, that's easier said, and that's why I talked about the post-American world. This is the first global crisis in which there is not even a hint of an, of an ambition of leadership from, from the White House. The US might change, but that's the way that we are today. So where then is the European Union? Where is Ukraine? Well, this is a crisis for the European Union as well, no doubt. Uh, but in much the same way as I think we've seen during the past few crises, they seem to hit us every five years. I mean, 10 years ago, we had the global financial crisis. Five years ago, we had the refugee crisis coming rather suddenly on the European Union. And the initial response is sometimes rather muddled, sometimes rather confused from the EU side. But after a while, you normally see it changing and you normally see all of the countries seeing that this is something that we have to sort out the one way or the other together. And we do see solutions emerging to these issues. I think we'll see the same with the COVID crisis. And I'd also think we are seeing the beginning of the EU taking a global leadership role when it comes to handling the COVID crisis. As we are discussing here, there is happening the World Health Assembly, that's online as well, where all of the member countries of the United Nations are discussing the issue. And the decisions that will be taken there will be taken on the basis of a resolution draft put forward by the European Union. The Chinese are fairly active as well, need to say the Americans less so, straight enough. Now, what's, what's for Ukraine? Um, in this particular situation. Well, first to stress the obvious things that I think some of us have been stressing for a long time. Um, Ukraine is secure. When Ukraine is stable and strong in its economy, in its society, in its democracy. It is insecure when it's weak and when it's divided. Because when you are weak and divided, and your economy is faltering and your politics is faltering as well, then you open up for others to play on divisions, and you know whom I'm referring to. So the reform process, absolutely critical. That is the first thing. And that is also the critical also for the relationship to the European Union. You have the DCFTA, the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement, you have the Association Agreement. These are very ambitious roadmaps for reforms of the Ukrainian economy for the coming few years. And a lot of things have been done. I mean, the Yatsenu government did a lot, no question about that. And Lina Slinkiewicz mentioned the land reform and mentioned the banking law. It took some time. I hope it's now firmly there. Uh, I would have wished there would have been somewhat more stability in governance during the last uh, few months. There have been sort of ministers coming and going and also on other key positions that have led to the questions whether the stability in governance is really there. That has to be the focus, because that creates credibility in Europe, and it creates strength versus those who want to meddle in the affairs of Ukraine, divide the country, and eventually acquire power over it. So that would be my main message. We are in a difficult time. The world is not what it used to be. We are all facing challenges of a nature that we are not used to. Europe is struggling to some extent. There's no question about that. I think it will sort out itself out, but it is struggling. But you have your number one task to secure the strength of your economy in these difficult times, to continue the reform process, and to stay on that particular course. If that is the case, you will continue to have the attention uh, of the European Union and the continued support of that, I am assured. Uh, I do thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Stay united, uh, not be divided. This is what Prime Minister Bildt uh, says in his article and in, key, in his re remarks, just pull together. And it fully corresponds to what Ambassador Kurt Walker wrote in his recent article uh, when he also touched upon the issues of what uh, should be built in the post-pandemic world. Ambassador, I do thank you very much for joining us. And I will immediately go into the substance of what you wrote. 
uh, you mentioned over there the importance of of reviving the the process of enlargement NATO and, and European Union, what fully corresponds and of, is of vital importance for Ukraine. But there you mentioned that that you mentioned some special novelty for the Article Five. Uh, for the Ukrainian audience, I will explain that this is the article which um, says about one for all, all for one use of force. If in your article you say that uh, this article should not be invoked uh, in particular in the sphere of those uh, areas occupied by Russia, diminishing, in my view, the, 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 the very sense of uh, NATO enlargement. Correct me if, if I'm wrong. Would you be so kind to, 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 to advise how should we pull Eastern Europe together in the context of what you wrote in your, in your very interesting and important piece? The floor right. is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Danilo, and uh, thank you for inviting me to take part in this discussion. Uh, it's an honor to be here with such uh, distinguished friends as, uh, as are here. And uh, let me also take a minute before I come back to your question, just to say uh, that uh, we're all suffering through this coronavirus uh, pandemic, whether it's in the United States or Ukraine or throughout Europe. And uh, we, we really do wish everyone in Ukraine well, health, safety for all of you. And we, we certainly are struggling for that ourselves as well. And we do have to think about how we come out of this. And that was the point uh, that I was making in my article. Uh, there will be a time when we are thinking about the post-pandemic. Uh, I agree very much with Carl Bildt in his diagnosis of where we are in this pandemic. And my concern is that as we emerge from it on the other side, if you will, it'll be authoritarian states, whether it's China or Russia, uh, who are better positioned to press their interests immediately. Uh, they are societies that uh, are already severely or strictly controlled by governments. They control information, uh, state control of resources and enterprises. Um, they will play with debt. They will play with numbers in ways that democracies with market economies and market-driven businesses are going to find a much harder time dealing with. And so what I was trying to argue in my article is that the West really needs to pull itself together and quickly as we think about where we go from here in a post-pandemic world. Uh, we will need the West to be more unified. Uh, we will need to be more ambitious. We'll need to be thinking much along the same lines that leaders of the West did at the end of World War II when we created institutions like NATO, uh, the European Coal and Steel Community that became the EU, uh, the United Nations, Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the IMF, the World Bank, and so forth. I think we need that kind of unity and purpose and creativity on the Western side of the equation to create the kind of world that's going to be good for our kind of societies. When you look at that, I think a couple of things emerge. One of them is that we need to have a series of agenda setting meetings among like-minded democracies, uh, the US and the European Union, uh, NATO, G7, in order to try to define what we want this world to be. Um, another is that I think we should revitalize efforts towards creating a transatlantic investment, growth, and resilience pact, where we try to put, instead of putting barriers up around nations, as has recently been the case in the West, we should be really looking at barriers around a much wider democratic community in the world and making sure that critical infrastructure is protected, supply chains are protected and sourced within that area. And then third, we have to talk about security as well. And here, uh, NATO remains the preeminent security organization uh, in the world and for democracies and able to protect its members and to project security forward. Uh, I think there are two things about NATO that we should talk about. One of them is it needs to be much more open in dealing with a full spectrum of threats. Military threats, NATO is extremely capable of dealing with, but we have other kinds of threats as well that as we see can equally impact our societies, whether it is cyber or whether it is health threats uh, or whether it is disinformation and so on. And NATO needs to have a wide aperture. And the second is that it should not be a closed organization, it should be an open organization. So any nation 
a, a European nation that meets the standards of membership, democracy, market economy, rule of law, contribution to uh, common security, uh, should indeed be considered for membership. And we need to re-energize that process, which has lost energy and, and commitment over, over years. As part of that, Russia is a, clearly on the other side of this. And this gets to your question, Danilo. Russia wants to prevent countries like Ukraine, like Georgia, like Moldova from joining the alliance. And it has occupied territory in these countries and NATO nations are reluctant to take on board as a member, a country where Russia occupies part of that territory because an Article 5 commitment could imply an immediate conflict with Russia to retake these territories by force. So the point that you're asking about in my article was to take this off the table and say, no, we will not give Russia a veto over the NATO membership of countries like Ukraine or Georgia or Moldova, just because they happen to occupy territory. Uh, we would say in a mutual agreement with NATO in that country, uh, we are not going to have Article 5 apply to those occupied territories immediately. Uh, there will be no first use of force to retake them. We support only their peaceful reintegration into the territorial integrity of the aspiring nations. And I think that uh, de-incentivizes, de if you will, Russia's continued occupation of these territories. So that's the point that you're asking about and, and uh, why I said that. But it does fit into this wider context of how I think the West more broadly needs to pull itself together to deal with the post-pandemic world. Uh, Ambassador, I, I do thank you for, the, for this comprehensive uh, answer. By the way, let me clarify yet another important thing. Recently, a U.S. ambassador in Warsaw admitted a possibility of redeployment the U.S. nuclear um, weapons uh, to, to, to that country. How would you command, uh, command this, this initiative? Well, uh, first off, I, I think um, what she was doing is saying that nothing is off the table as opposed to saying that there is a plan to do so. So I don't, I don't think her comments should be misinterpreted that way. Uh, second, uh, our objectives uh, as the United States, as Europeans, all of us, is to see a diminishing role of nuclear weapons in the world. Unfortunately, we have states like Russia that have large nuclear stockpiles, tactical weapons pointed at Europe. Uh, they violated the INF Treaty, and so they have intermediate range weapons as well which they should not have done. So we had to step back from that in order to prepare ourselves to deter um, that nuclear development. And unfortunately, we also have other states like China that possesses a significant nu nuclear arsenal, uh, like Iran, like North Korea, that are seeking to develop viable nuclear weapons. So our goal is to diminish the reliance on nuclear weapons. But until that is the case, we need to rely on a standing deterrent. And that deterrent uh, will be uh, made as uh, effective and stable and reliable as possible to create predictability. And uh, that's why it's important not to place limitations on that without there being part of broader arms control limitations affecting all of these weapons. I do appreciate it. And now I turn to Senator Martin Bosatsky. I do thank you very much for, for being with us. Uh, for, uh, Mr. Senator, Your Excellency, um, Definitely, Ukraine, Kyiv, uh, we all are interest, interested to see Poland strong. This is, this is part of our uh, national security concept. This is part of our national security interest. Uh, how would you, uh, how do you see uh, the relations, uh, the strategic partnership in our region? What would you improve? And how would you assess the state of affairs between Ukraine and Poland now? Uh, you're welcome, sir. Спочатку я хочу привітати наших українських господарів і також глядачів. Дуже дякую за запрошення. But uh, coming back to English, um, I do think we share in Central and Eastern Europe, from Northern Caucasus to Warsaw and Prague, and from uh, Tallinn at least, maybe Helsinki and Stockholm, to uh, Western Bal Balkans, the common uh, strategic um, uh, sensitivity as well as uh, threat assessment, which is uh, not changing basically. 
Uh, I'm putting aside the growing uh, efforts of Chinese influence. The main threat is uh, the ambition of Putin's Russia, and probably, as you said, um, it goes beyond Mr. Putin. The Russia's uh, ambition to re-establish control slash influence over our part of Europe. Um, it doesn't change. It was the same 20 years ago. It was the same 10 or five years ago. What has been changing is the ability of the West to respond. Contrary to the Cold War and contrary to the um, times of uh, 20, 10 or even five years ago, uh, unfortunately, the West is less united uh, and doesn't have the same ambition to compete. Um, because of uh, many crises, which, uh, for example, uh, Carl Bildt uh, rightfully described, um, but also because of a growing lack of self-confidence and cooperation between both sides of the Atlantic, so U.S., and Canada, uh, uh, and, and main powers in Europe. Uh, what then, what should countries like Ukraine and Poland and Baltic states do? First, to, to decrease the, the level of misunderstanding between those two parts, so between US and European Union. Uh, we are sometimes uh, tempted to choose between big European powers or European Union as such, and US, we should uh, absolutely reject those temptations. Uh, one of uh, which was just described by you, uh, uh, some actions of uh, American ambassador in, in Warsaw. Uh, second, uh, we should strengthen and rebuild the self-confidence of European Union, Union as such. The stronger European Union, uh, the better for our region, and only self-confident again European Union can even think about further enlargement. It is off the table now because of the lack of cohesion and strategic thinking uh, in European capitals. Thirdly, we should re-establish at least re-establish the level of influence of our region within Europe and within NATO. Unfortunately, it has been declining for the past um, few years. Um, and um, it, it's also important for Ukraine to have a Poland, Warsaw, Prague, um, uh, even Budapest capable of um, influencing uh, the big European power further to the West. And the fourth, my fourth point uh, corresponds with the first three, which is we cannot neglect the declining level of um, democracy and rule of law in our region. Um, the uh, Freedom House report just published 10 days ago um, uh, says that the level of democracy in our region is the lowest since uh, early 1990s. It describes Hungary as uh, a hybrid democracy and Poland as on the path to it. The reason why we are, um, why our influence on the big um, European powers and the re and European Union as such, and our declining uh, um, ability to bridge the differences between U U.S. and some European powers in matters that are important for us comes from that. So um, to conclude, the more um, integrated and influential influential within European Union and NATO we are, we are Central and Eastern Europe, the better for both our nations and other, other, other nations in the, in the region.
Uh, I, do, I do. I do. Thank you. And now, uh, let me let me turn to uh, Ms. Ivana Klimpush Sensazov, the former Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration, and the incumbent chairwoman of the European Integration Committee of Ukraine's Parliament. Uh, Ivanko, uh, uh, you know our discussion is called the strategic stronghold. It's kind of a military form of expression. Uh, what do you think? What Ukraine should invest in this strategic stronghold of Eastern Europe? Uh, what should be our contribution? And where where are the red lines of our positions? The floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Danilo. You know, I think that Ukraine has already in, made its major investment in this strategic stronghold in the in the strategic partnership with Eastern Europe, with Europe and with the civilized world. And this is, has been done by thousands of Ukrainian soldiers and thousands of Ukrainian civilians who have died because of the Russian aggression uh, in our country. And I think that because of their sacrifice, the uh, Ruski Mir has been stopped at our eastern border and not on the eastern border of any of our uh, Western um, neighbors, um, basically not at the eastern border of uh, NATO or or the EU. And I think we have to speak not about Ukraine's investment. I think it's about common investments in this in this partnership. Moreover, I think we should be talking not that much about partnership. I think partnership is the wrong world right a word right now. I think uh, we are um, in the vague of this um, of the threat that we all understand in this region in eastern central europe i think we are just natural part uh, natural allies uh to this anti-putin coalition and i think what's lacking right now and what's important as investment from both sides is um in in uh, to have um to have honesty to have integrity and have unity in this mo in this moment and then i think we all, all are really lacking this honesty and real sincere um unity in the eu and actually in this wider uh wider europe as well um i think in our region in the um you know in the central eastern europe we um we have a, sh a shared understanding where the threat comes from and that's what we've heard basically from all the uh from all the speakers today and i think that this is the benefit in comparison to to to, to the work that information work and explanatory work that still has to be probably done in some of the Western European uh, countries. So um, just recently Poland has adopted the new national defense strategy where it's clearly uh, pointed out that uh, Russian aggress aggressive behavior, Russia is a major threat for, for Poland. And I think we all share this and we have to understand that um, having on the eastern part weak and unstable Ukraine would actually be uh, a serious challenge for, um, for for Eastern European countries, for Central European countries, and for the EU and NATO. So it's important for us to, to get stronger together. And I think with this understanding, our you know, neighbors like Hungary should probably uh, come back to and refresh its memory of the Russian tanks of 56 and stop um, speculating on the um, actually exaggerated and, and made up uh, problems with the Ukraine, uh, with the uh, uh, Hungarian national minority in Ukraine and stop blocking our deeper integration with NATO. And I think some of the forces in Poland also uh, should stop exploiting historical um, narrative for the benefit of the internal situation and actually leave the history to historians and um, because it's enough that Russia is already playing these games with history and we should not help it uh, should be we should not be helping them and so uh, then it means that we are then creating a ground for common uh, common work and common goals and common opportunities as well I agree with Arseny who was saying that this is strange that Ukraine is still not part of three seas initiative. There are other, um, you know, regional initiatives where, uh, um, if Ukraine was included, um, they would only become stronger and more efficient. So I think with um, all this understanding that uh, we are benefiting from being together, 
uh, we are we would be benefiting from Ukraine being in the EU and NATO, not only us, but it's in the national interest of our of our partners. This is kind of a, a common homework for all of us, how we should invest in our common future. Uh, I do thank you. I'm really pleased that Ukra the Ukrainian participants of our discussion, they speak one voice. And I'm happy that Ivan supported the, the idea of Arseniy Yatsenyuk of uh, appealing to our neighbors of, uh, to, to, to include Ukraine in those uh, regional initiatives that lack Ukraine's presence. And this is Intermarium, this is Bucharest 9, uh, which is, in my opinion, is of fundamental importance. And that app definitely will contribute to the general stability and prosperity in our region. Uh, and now let me turn to the second part of our discussion, which relates to the European integration uh, um, of Ukraine. And I'm happy that, uh, that Foreign Minister Linkiewicz uh, uh, remains with us. And I, and I am going to, to uh, put that question to you, Mr. Minister. Uh, you know, uh, yesterday I watched Ukrainian television and I witnessed that uh, uh, that uh, some of Ukrainian media being under the influence of the Russian propaganda, they uh, translate the message that the European Union simply doesn't care about Ukraine. Brussels doesn't care. This is the message that the Kremlin uh, is spreading among, among the Ukrainian society. And they, uh, they are quite successful in doing this. On another hand, we have a great fact that the, the European Parliament uh, endorsed a decision to provide Ukraine with more than one, one, one billion euros for, uh, to mitigate impact of uh, coronavirus. This is an example of, of, of strong solidarity with Ukraine, which is definitely needed uh, for, uh, right now here. Um, so we have, in real terms, a lot of good signs. On another thing, a lot of experts in Ukraine, they, they uh, diagnose that, uh, the, the, that, that the real Ukrainian European integration uh, suffers the lowest dynamics since 2019. So uh, a lot of, uh, I believe, a lot of objective reasons uh, uh, create, uh, establish, establish the context for that. But nevertheless, the lowest dynamics. Mr. Minister, do you see any problems? What would you, uh, uh, what kind of message would you say, send uh, to the Ukrainian authorities in terms of the uh, European, in, of the real European integration of our nation? Uh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. As I said already during my first inter intervention, I, I, I can repeat, uh, let's be frank, so to say, let's speak openly. Uh, the support is not terribly big, I told, and this is really not, not, not increasing and not expanding. So it's our task to make sure that this is not uh, uh, the tendency, but something what is happening now. Uh, definitely easy, easy again to say, but uh, opponents, skeptics, always pointing out at the inefficiency of reforms. I already mentioned that, I will not repeat, especially the rule of law, uh, especially judicial uh, uh, reforms, uh, fight with corruption, and uh, that's uh, that. why it was very important to pass these laws I already mentioned, will not repeat. Uh, what we can do, uh, definitely uh, to build this uh, agreement among, among our, our, our countries, which is not easily built, and uh, now, now it's a very concrete tactical uh, target for us uh, to organize uh, in a normal format Eastern Partnership Summit. It should take uh, place in uh, the middle of June. Uh, as we all understand, it will not be a normal way. It should be VTC uh, form, but again, let's big discussion whether to do that uh, just uh, with the participation of European Union leaders and, and, and Eastern Partners, or, or, or to have it in the full format as it should be, as it was, for instance, a summit of Western Balkans recently. So uh, here, uh, this is also kind of a very symptomatic thing. Same. Uh, as, as, as it was uh, announced that uh, Eastern Partnership Ministerial meeting was uh, cancelled, but uh, now we are coming back to this issue and I hope uh, it will take place before, before summit in due time. At least we are discussing now with High Representative uh, Joseph Borrell uh, this opportunity. So we have to, <laughs> again, kind of uh, correct or... or, or, or or so, sometimes to come back to the norm, normal normal way of cooperation, which is really a big challenge. So what we have, have to do, 
uh, just to continue pushing, as I said. Uh, and uh, the best response uh, would be efficiency of reforms, efficiency of, of our policy, what we're doing uh, on the ground, uh, clarity of our vision. Uh, if we are fighting for the summits and declarations uh, at the summit to be issued, it's not enough. Uh, also, uh, partners should be active for, on their own way. I know, let's be again frank, that uh, in Ukraine was, uh, as far as I understand, uh, never was kind of big enthusiast for Eastern Partnership Program. It was considered like a how to put it more mildly, uh, but this is partly true. So, But we always uh, were of the opinion, let me repeat, that you should use any leverage you have in your possession, any, any channel of communication uh, in order to show your co cooperative, so to say, approach and definitely uh, trying to define your peculiarities and uh, individual uh, requirements, what uh, is always very important, but also not less important to find uh, the, the ways where you can find common approach with other aspirant countries. Uh, when it comes to the uh, concrete substance of what we're talking, in integration into European, so to say, kitchen, it has to do the uh, most important thing, I believe, to integrate into single digital market, for instance, of European Union, which is, again, uh, support, I would say, not always here. And we have really to uh, put arguments on the table and to explain how it is important. We have to invest into the projects which are tangible and understandable to the people same as visa-free regime. Uh, it was clear that uh, freedom of movement, uh, not the best time to talk during pandemics, but in general terms, we, come, we will come back to that. Same, I believe, would be a very important project like roaming, for instance, right? People would understand that they are really getting closer to, uh, to, 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 to European, so to say, way of life even, uh, which, is, which is definitely uh, something uh, where we really should uh, join our forces and try to make sure that it will, it will happen. So uh, in short, uh, time is, I agree with uh, your assessment, time is not good. Uh, situation not improving, but doesn't mean that we should give up. And uh, looking around who is guilty, let's try to do ourselves what we can, can, can do. And definitely, as I said, we will be more than happy uh, to, 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 well, to show our, our, so to say, solidarity in practice. Uh, but we cannot do for you. You should do yourself many things. So this is also a very important point. So thank you. Thank you for summing this up. This is, this is extremely important. And Mr. Minister, just a final note, and sorry for improvising. You mentioned the Eastern Partnership Summit uh, and Eastern Partnership uh, dimension of our cooperation, which is important, vitally important. And we, we thank all those initiate, uh, initiators of this kind of cooperation. But nevertheless, if we look at the Eastern Europe, we definitely see that our interests are combined, first of all. They, 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 they move us to, to establish some kind of better, I would say, uh, uh, for cooperation here. Don't you think that there is a need, and sorry again for improvising, a need for any kind of Eastern European summit to, to discuss that, to discuss the, the, the threats we, we face, uh, the threat from Russia, pandemic, economic crisis, and so on. How would you comment on this? Oh, let's uh, uh, look for commonalities, but we also uh, understand quite clearly, and we understand also your, so to say, precautions sometimes, that uh, all six, uh, six countries, members of Eastern Partnership Program, are very different. And even those three uh, so-called association members, they also are different. So there are a lot of differences, but nevertheless, uh, our approach, self-differentiation and selective approach or whatever uh, means that we should work more closely with those who are ready to do more, those who are ready to accept more, those who, those who are going to go deeper, wider. So this is kind of uh, self-differentiation. It's not, uh, it's not uh, so to say, kind of punishment of those who are not willing. So definitely they feel more comfortable in the dialogue like this and uh, having no, no not big ambitions. Uh, so uh, that, that means that we will not have probably the same approach with regard to the threats, right, in the region even. Uh, sometimes when we're talking about policy with Russia, I, I do not feel that we will find common approach with all six uh, uh, countries of Eastern Partnership uh, towards, towards that, so to say, objective. It will be also different. But this doesn't mean that we can, cannot uh, try to build a common platform where it is possible, especially with those, as I would like to stress, uh, willing to do more. That's exactly the way to go. And it's, uh, it's a, a, again, up to the partners to show this initiative. 
uh, we will be, uh, so to say, always uh, supportive here and we always stressing ourselves. But this initiative should come from the partners and definitely this is, this is uh, your responsibility, regardless, again, all obstacles and hurdles which are around and despite the situation which is not uh, most permissive for environment for what we're talking, but nevertheless, this is exactly the only way to go and I would advise to, to do that. Uh, I, I do thank you, uh, I do thank you, uh, Mr. Minister, and thank you very much for, for your common article, for your joint article uh, commemorating the genocide of the Crimean Tatars and for mentioning this, uh, one of the biggest tragedies in, in, in the history of Ukraine. Uh, and now I would turn to Prime Minister Karl Bild. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, if I may, I just want to, to make a linkage with what Ambassador Kurt Walker said. Uh, in his article, he suggested to somehow to intensify the cooperation of, of the world democracies and to establish this D10, if, I, if I'm, if I'm, not, uh, if I'm uh, not mistaken, of D10 format, the 10 biggest, biggest world uh, democracies. Uh, how would you react uh, to, this kind, to this type of practical suggestions uh, in order to protect uh, the world democracy to protect Europe and for from the Ukrainian perspective, the U Ukrainian democracy from from the threats we face uh, uh, of, of in this new international reality. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Well, I would certainly endorse uh, whatever we can do in order to strengthen the cooperation between the de different democracies around the world. Um, we need to have cooperation also with the non-democracies that could be nuclear, nuclear non-proliferation or could be climate or whatever. There are quite a number of issues. Health, where we need universal, irrespectively of the state of their particular governance. Uh, but then democracies are closer to each other. We understand each other somewhat better. We have more transparent societies. We have quite a number of advantages. And if I see it from the EU point of view, absolutely, the links across the Atlantic are very important. And, and, and if you listen to European speakers, they would stress that time after time. Uh, we are in a rather unfortunate situation that that is not the language that we hear coming out of the White House at the moment. Uh, there might be a change in that particular respect in the United States. We don't know, but there might not be. But there will also be, I think, a uh, necessity to develop better relationship. First, we have to from the European point of view, make certain that we got some sort of stable and constructive and good relationship with United Kingdom. Uh, they have taken some less wise decisions, but they are still a democracy. We have the world's largest democracy, India, which has a growing weight on the international stage, an important economy, an industrial powerhouse as well. There are some aspects of its domestic policies that we might disagree with, but anyhow, they're important. And we've seen in this particular COVID crisis, by the way, that uh, it hasn't necessarily been the authoritarian regimes that have been the best. The ones that have been doing it best have been the South Korea and Taiwan, to mention those two. And Taiwan is not a dictatorship. South Korea even managed to have an election in the middle of the crisis. And that has demonstrated that democracy is not only nice because it does respect human rights, it is also fairly effective when it comes to being agile and answering to threats. So I, I do think there is much we can do in order to strengthen cooperation between the democracies. And it's always easier because there is more commonality, there is transparency in our respective policies, and there is the unity or at least uniformity to some extent of the basic values of our societies. Uh, I do appreciate uh, uh... Uh, Ambassador Walker, uh, if I may, to, 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 to proceed with uh, the next question uh, to you. Uh, what we experience here in Ukraine right now is that the, a lot of Ukrainian activists, civic activists, are concerned, are concerned and they feel concerned with many signs of what um, we find the, the signs of pro-Russian revanchism in, in Ukraine and a dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, signs of uh, unpredictable uh, uh, tendency. Uh, uh, Ambassador, the public opinion in Ukraine becomes critical. And what would be your advice for the civic society in Ukraine uh, to make everything possible to protect Ukraine's president against mistake 
mistakes and to make our Western course real. The floor is yours, please. Okay, well, well thank you very much again. Um, let me first say that I think um, Ukraine has had a long trajectory since its independence in 1991. There has not been a single moment where everything was done and everything was moving in the right direction. There have always been challenges. Uh, during the time that uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk was in power, uh, during the current government as well, uh, it is always a struggle, it is always difficult. And like Minister Lankavichis, I think the current government has done a good job when it comes to some key pieces of legislation, uh, like land reform, like the banking legislation. And it is important that Ukraine just keep moving on the same path moving forward. That's one thing. The second to, to your question and the feeling of uh, pro-Russian sentiment or Russian revanchism within Ukraine, uh, there has always been some element of support for Russia and being part of a wider Russian empire within Ukraine. It is not the majority, it is not strong, but it has existed. And I would argue that Ukraine over time has become more unified, uh, more of a, a sense of Ukrainian national identity and national interest, more pro-Western, more pro-NATO, more seeking to be integrated with the rest of Europe, more committed to democracy and to reform domestically. And I think the prescription really is for those forces in Ukraine, which represent the vast majority of the country, at least 75% to 80% of the voters and of the parliament to work more closely together. Uh, I know there's always political competition among political parties, but the real dividing line within Ukraine is those who favor a democratic, uh, prosperous and European future for the country and those who don't. And those who do favor those things need to work as closely as possible to bring the country forward. I, I do, I do, I do. Thank you, uh, the, Mr. Senator. Uh, for the Polish and the Lithuanian uh, politicians remain uh, the most prominent, the most um, active uh, promoters uh, uh, and advocates of Ukraine in the European institutions. What would you advise uh, the Ukrainian authorities? Um, in order to intensify the dialogue with this, with the, these groups, family of friends of our nation within the uh, European institutions, within the European structures, the European European Parliament, and uh, within the Brussels environment, if I may. Probably three things. One is. Um, Keep your fingers crossed for um, Europe to overcome its uh, many crises uh, mentioned before and uh, to move from the stage of crisis management toward the phase of, uh, again, of ambitious uh, strategic planning. Uh, that's number one. Second, as I said, the stronger the influence of countries like uh, Poland, uh, uh, Visegrad Group, uh, Baltic states within the structures of European Union, the better for you. Because remember, 10 years ago, uh, the Eastern Partnership started from the Swedish-Polish initiative, supported by the region, then supported by the Germans, and then we were able to convince the rest of uh, European Union to present the the strategic perspective for those six nations, including um, first and foremost Ukraine, um, uh, with European path. And that was, that was our initiative. Uh, those times need to come back to think about real, not only vocal, but real political help of Poland and other countries in the region for European, for European uh, Ukrainian uh, ambitions. And thirdly, um, I notice with, uh, with satisfaction that uh, some forces within Ukraine, which um, also were playing nationalistic and historical cards um, uh, in Polish Ukrainian uh, or Ukrainian Polish relations, are now much less uh, influential. Um, and um, this is good. Uh, we still lack the change on Polish side. We still see many 
um, uh, acts of uh, creating um, historical revanchism toward uh, Ukraine on Polish political scene. Um, I also noticed uh, some good gest gestures from the current government as the article of Prime Minister Morawiecki, which you mentioned before. Uh, but we really need to focus on uh, strategic cooperation between our two nations, which are in our region, the biggest um, nations with the, the, the biggest potential to influence the West and European Union. We need more uh, um, strategic, diplomatic um, uh, defense um, actions together. But the first condition is to rebuild the, the trust between uh, our leaderships. Wonderful. I, I, I do thank you. And now I turn to, to Ms. Ivan uh, Klimpurstens. Uh, Ivanko, how would you assess the state of the uh, uh, European integration of Ukraine these days? The floor is yours. Uh, Danilo, I think that this uh, two or three minutes that we have left uh, is not enough to actually outline what I think about current stage of European integration. I think we've lost the pace uh, from here from the Ukraine side. I think, um, unfortunately, we have more declarations on behalf of the government and the executive authorities from Ukraine uh, rather than uh, real work. And I totally subscribe to, to what Linus was saying that, um, you know, our partners cannot do the job for us. So I would like to see our government being um, more focused on the whole work here in Ukraine and delivering upon reforms that we have started. And we know how not um, how difficult it was and how to di difficult it was to get the consensus on different um, on different changes of the rules when the rules are becoming more transparent when t when you know some interests are being stepped on and um, I'm sure that uh, Arseny also has a lot to share about this uh, so that's not what's happening right now and um, the declarations are there but uh, the substance uh, from my perspective is being is being right now lost so uh, it's my call towards the Ukrainian government to be more clear, more vocal, and more uh, and and really concentrate on work. But also, uh, what's important here is that um, you know we are lacking this leadership, guidance, strategy, uh, vision, also from the EU side and and also the political will, because um, you know. Uh, the EU has been always shying off um, to take the decision on providing Ukraine with European membership uh, perspective. And that's something that is still hurting for us because um, I do not see why Albania or Northern Macedonia, I'm sorry, sorry, or any other Western Balkan nation is more European rather uh, than, than Ukraine. I think we are as European as those nations. And moreover, I think it would be not only beneficial for us uh, here in Ukraine to become uh, part also, the formal uh, union, not only, you know, mentally being part of it, not only historically, culturally being part of, of, uh, of Europe, but also becoming part of the European Union and NATO. And it would be also in the interest, in the national interest of the nation, uh, nation members. So I think here the work that should be done by our partners inside the union, uh, inside the um, alliance as well, is very, very important. Uh, I do thank you. And then I, I, I put this question to Arsenio Yatsinyuk. So how do you see this picture? How do you see this, this big picture of the European integration of Ukraine? The floor is yours. And that's an issue, Danilo. We need clarity. Let's set a clear cut targets. When the Ukraine will be the member of the European Union? Let's say yes or no. We do understand that this is to be a very long, bumpy, difficult, hard road. That's true. But we need to see something very clear to the Ukrainian people. This is the way we are moving to. Let's answer the question, whether Ukraine will be the member of NATO and what kind of preconditions we have to meet. It's normal because we need to do our homework, no doubt. But for the Ukrainian leadership and for the Ukrainian people, it's important to realize whether these targets are achievable and whether they are set. And 
for, for the ordinary people, it's important to say, look, these deliverables you're going to get. People have to feel it. People have to use it. People have to understand, like, for example, these are free regime. They have to comprehend, to, to coincide, sorry, their dream with the reality. So in order to achieve these targets, we need to have pro western coalition in the Ukrainian government and in the Ukrainian administration. Look at the numbers. They are not as optimistic as I expected in terms of the implementation of the DCFTA. In 2014 and 15, it was more than 94% of the implementation of the, of the action plan that was enforced by the government. For today, it's just around 38%. In the European Union, we need to have a pro-Ukrainian coalition of a Polish friends, real strong friends, our Lithuanian friends, uh, those who really want to see Ukraine as a member of big united EU family. So to set the target, to have the pro-Ukrainian coalition in the European Union, to have the pro-Western coalition in the Ukrainian government, to have strong US leadership and Ambassador Volker. I, I always reiterate the same message. I still believe in you, not only personally in you, but in the United States of America, in your values, in your leadership, and in your ability to lead this Crazy new world. Otherwise, someone else will lead. So thank I thank you. I, I thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, before we finish, we have a limited time. But uh, nevertheless, I, I would like to invite you to make a brief, very, con very brief, uh, one sentence only concluding remark, concluding message that you, are that you would like to send to the Ukrainian and international audience in the context of our discussion. And uh, now I start from Prime Minister Karl Wild. The floor is yours, sir. Stability of economic reform, stability of democracy, stability of European reforms. That's the key to the security of Ukraine, and the security of Ukraine is the key to the security of Europe. Wonderful. I do thank you. Uh, Mr. Senator, what would be the message from Poland, from Warsaw and Poznan? The floor is yours. I'd like to say to our Ukrainian friends that uh, despite the fact that we are in the dire straits of the epidemic crisis, economical crisis, and the crisis of confidence in Europe, uh, I'm absolutely sure that we will not be only waiting for you to join EU, but we will uh, finally to move toward it with our political plans and with our support. But of course, you need to do it. It is painful, but it needs to be done. The, the pro-democratic and um, uh, also economic reforms. Uh, but we will be in the European family together. Wonderful. I do, I do thank you. Uh, Ivana, what would be your concluding remark? The floor is I'll, I'll rephrase what uh, St. John Paul II said once about Poland, um, that without European Ukraine, there is no European Europe. And I think European Europe is the key here. Uh, I thank you. And uh, Ambassador Walker, please, the floor is yours. Well, I think that the coronavirus is going to hurt us all, both uh, from a health perspective, but also economically and politically. And so while we've had problems in the past with leadership, with nationalism, with populism, uh, building barriers among democracies in the world, uh, now is the time to actually uh, look for leadership to overcome those. We have to pull ourselves together. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, by this, let me conclude our, our panel, our discussion. I do thank uh, all, all the participants for, for their interesting and great contrib contribution and for, for their remarks. And uh, these are two messages that we delivered today. Let's pull together, let's, let's stay together, and let's have this ball rolling and rolling further for the benefit for, for the world democracy, for the benefit of Europe, and for the benefit of our nations. Duże dziękuję. I do thank you very much.